on thinking about reading and note taking. Um, so first of all, you wouldn't be here if you weren't already really good at reading and note taking. So I realized that uh, there may be some redundancy in a lot of what I'm saying, and um, and so I preface my comments with that that I, that some of this may be stuff you already do or know really well. There may be things that I say that clash with things that already work really well for you. Um, this is just one idiosyncratic person's vision how you do this stuff. And so my, my hope is to put some of this out there with the occasion that we'll get a conversation going where I might learn some things from you all about ways that I can be taking notes and reading better as well. Uh, but these are some tips that I've worked out for myself uh, and as well as in conversation with other people. And so my hope is that some of what I have here might be might be useful. Um, okay, so um, so first, you know, how to read for grad school. Um, well, first, I think it's best to start by asking why we read in grad school, uh, which may be seem too obvious to even uh, ask. And yet, by asking that question, what we realize is there are a lot of different reasons we read in grad school, and therefore, I think different ways that we might want to think about reading to pertain to those very different reasons that we read. Right. Um, so first, we read to master historical material, right, to just like get basic narratives, characters, processes down. We read in order to get some command of chief lines of argument and interpretation, right? The historiographic dimension. Uh, we scout out potential research topics, importantly. Uh, and we look for potential sources of primary documents or secondary sources. But these are all very different tasks if you think about when we sit down in front of a book. And yet we often kind of think about it as a, as a homogeneous process. Um, now importantly, we also are reading in very different contexts, right? We're reading in seminars, often under intense pressure, and I'm culpable for applying some of that pressure uh, uh, in my seminar this year. Uh, we read for our own research endlessly for the rest of our lives, um, and uh, we read, um, maybe even, uh, we read for our teaching, certainly, right? usually at 3 a.m., so you know, the night before, we're going to be teaching new material to our undergrads. Um, and then also we may even read sometimes in our spare time, this sort of material for fun. Uh, so in terms of figuring out how best to read, I think, it's best to start, I think, with knowing why in particular you're reading. So to have a sense of the specific task, so you can adapt your reading technique to the task at hand. And here I want to identify what for me are three different levels or types of reading that I think we can identify. And these are ones that you all are probably applying already, consciously or not. Um, but just to typologize them for purposes of a conversation. One is what I'm calling a surface read. This is a relatively quick read in which you're going into a text for interpretation, for basic lines of argument, for coverage, for the structure of claims that are being made, for a sense of the various different scopes of a project, right? Time, actors, geography, etc. You're going to work the apparatus around the book pretty hard. You're going to read the introduction really, really slowly and carefully. You're going to read the conclusion really carefully. You're going to read topic sentences really carefully, right? And if you're honest with yourself, and if you're thorough, you're going to have to dip into some of that material in the middle. Right? Uh, because authors, of course, can make claims about what they're going to do in the introduction, which they don't deliver on. Right? So it can all sound good from the outer packaging. Right? So you have to dig in and see whether what they're promising to do in the book or article is actually what they're, what they're delivering on. Okay, so that's what I'm calling a surface read. Um, the second is what I'm calling a deep read. Right? That's where you're going to spend a lot more time. You're going to go through the book much more thoroughly and meticulously. Um, you're going to not just want to know the main argument that the author's making, but you're going to know all the moves they're making to support that argument. You're going to want to have a sense of the whole architecture of a set of claims. And the way evidence is mobilized not only for the major argument, for all the sub-arguments. Um, um, in practical terms, for a deep read, you're going to want to read the whole thing. Right? Uh, and then finally, I'm, I'm putting what I call uh, a scratch read. Um, and this is, you can think about this as a kind of extractive read. It tends to happen more when you're researching than when you're teaching. And it involves going in very strategically and instrumentally to pull certain things out of a book that you need for something you're writing. Right? You essentially see this as going in, you know, it's essentially working a book through the index, right? Rather than through the book's own logic. This is the kind of reading that you're going to be mostly doing not during teaching and not during seminar work, hopefully, but during your own research. When in fact, reading the entire book of any book you encounter is going to be a disaster. You have to be very careful about making decisions. And, but this is also another kind of reading. It's one that you have to, uh, you have to implement and to, to know what you're doing. Um, so, um, okay, so how do you know which of these kinds of readings to employ? 
uh, for use in, in class. Well, I think it's, it's important here to be very pragmatic. Uh, first, just think about how much time you have, given the other constraints that you, that you have going on in your life. Um, now obviously, in grad school, time is tight, uh, including for events like this one. Uh, so, um, so given the amount of time you have, you have to establish certain kinds of priorities in terms of the reading that's presented to you. Um, uh, so you want to think about which books or articles are likely to be the ones that are going to be the most important to you in the long term. And that can be hard to know at the start of a graduate career, but you may have some impulses, and I think you can trust those impulses to some extent. Which of these books or articles looks most important and compelling um, is one question. The other is, which of these have you not been exposed to that much yet? That may be another reason for increasing the depth of your reading. It's actually not measured in terms of your sense of its importance, but you know, I you kind of have already been exposed to these two or three books or articles, but these ones are the ones I haven't read thoroughly yet. And that, that may be another set of criteria for looking at when you should go deeper, is precisely when you are stretching and you have not been exposed to them. Um, um, one thing that you can do is to actually uh, read books on reading, uh, which is something that, okay, not, not that you need other people to suggest books that you should be reading at this point, um, but there are some very good books that can just help you think about your own reading process and little ways you can tweak your reading so that you can work a book more efficiently and more thoroughly. And I, uh, at the end of this lecture, I have a, a recommended book that I, I like a lot. Um, one very general tip to think about is to read with focused, self-conscious intention. And this is something that any guidebook you pick up about efficient reading will tell you that there's a way you can think about reading as subjecting yourself to the kind of onrushing force of a lot of prose, right, and a lot of text. Um, but there's another way to think about it in terms of one's own intentionality in moving forward into that onrush, right? Um, and then you're more likely to retain and process the reading you're doing if you are always mindful and attentive to what it is at any particular moment you're hoping to get from what you're reading. And this, again, it may seem totally obvious, but it's also quite easy to lose track of what you're trying to get out of the book at any particular moment. And it can change over the course of the reading you're doing. Um, but the more likely you are to maintain a kind of ongoing uh, sense of being in touch with what is it, what's the question I'm asking of this book right now, the more likely that you're going to be able to extract the kind of answers that you want, and the more likely you are to be able to retain um, that material. Um, okay, now an obvious question. Should you feel guilty for doing a surface reading rather than a deep reading in graduate school? Like, should I even be suggesting this as a possibility, right? I mean, my job is to get up in front of you and say, it's all deep. If any of you don't do deep reading, you're all in trouble, right? Um, so should you feel guilty about doing a surface reading? That's up to you. I'm not going to help you uh, manage your own uh, guilt around this. Um, um, one thing, though, that I think can help you feel that question is to realize that any book that's important to your development intellectually over the long term is a book that you're going to have encounters with again and again and again. So if there's a case of a book that you, for reasons of pragmatism and time, you're not able to read with the depth that you, you'd like, this is not going to be the last encounter you have. It can feel like that. Um, but comps is there, and your dissertation research is there, and teaching is there, um, and so any book that you're likely to have that kind of relationship with is, is going to be one you have a chance to revisit at lots of different levels of depth. So one way to think about a surface kind of read is that it's a kind of getting to know you read, right? It's a kind of small talk read, right? And it doesn't preclude a deeper and more profound conversation later, later on, right? Um, okay, so turning to the question of of notes. So why take notes? Again, one of these obvious questions, or seemingly obvious. The obvious reason we take notes is right, so we don't have to read the dang book again, right? So we keep these things filed so that it's a time-saving device. Like that's the way that we're accustomed to think about notes. It becomes a substitute for the thing itself. And that makes sense, because that's a lot of the way we end up using notes. But there's a less obvious uh, way to think about notes, which I think may even be more important. Um, and that's that it becomes a critical part of getting the stuff in our heads in the first place. And here, just using some like very badly processed cognitive psychology, there is something to the conclusion that the way we learn is through re-exposure, right? And the more, the more times that you're exposed to certain material and the different contexts 
that you're exposed to it in, and the different ways that you manipulate and use that material, the more likely that you're going to be able to take it in and make it your own. And I think notes are actually how we do this. Um, it's where we translate what we're reading into our own terms, right? It's how we process it and internalize it and make it something that we can work with. Um, so what I'm going to present um, are just some ways of thinking about notes in ways that are aimed at maximizing your own opportunities for working with this material, right? Not only for later utility as a time-saving device, but also so that it's a process of you apprehending this material yourself. Okay. So what I'm presenting is a two-round plan and maybe with a third for possibility for people that are interested in it. The first round I'm calling running notes. These are the notes that you take while you're reading, right, in the process of just as your eyes are moving over the page. The second are what I'm calling process notes. That's, these are the notes you take after you're done reading a text, right, in which I think you're doing the majority of the work of making the work uh, something you can work with. And then the third, and I'm saying kind of semi-optional, are what I'm calling inside out or teaching notes. And this is actually when you read a work with an eye towards turning it into a set of questions and answers which you could then use in a seminar setting. So you're in a sense taking a book and turning it into a class. All right? And this is something that you can use as a way of, again, um, working with the notes in a different context uh, as a way of helping you apprehend. Okay, so first, running notes. Um, I mean, for me anyway, and I tend to be someone who takes way too many notes. So for me, a general guideline I try to apply to myself is one to two lines per page um, to limit myself, to force myself into that kind of concision. What is this page about, right? Or what are the two paragraphs in this page about in a few words? Um, so that an average article will fit on one or two sides of paper, and an average book may fit on 10 sides. People are going to have lots of different standards about what they're comfortable with. I put this discipline on myself because otherwise I would more or less reproduce the books in question in a kind of Jorge Luis Borges kind of way. Um, and that helps a little bit. So, um, okay, the other guideline, at least this is something that I do and which I find useful, is that on the lower section, and some people use the side, you know, people have different aesthetics, you draw a line, and under that you're not taking notes about the content in a kind of running commentary. You're starting to reflect critically on what you're reading. Right? So arguments you're having, things you like, footnotes you want to track down, sources you're wondering where this author is getting all this from. It's that bottom or side margin where you're keeping track of that. Um, and you do that so that you have a running sense of if you keep it on a separate page, you may have trouble visually linking it to where you got it from. If you put it on the same page, then you're able to very quickly kind of figure out what's the relationship between the kind of quibble or exciting moment I was having with this text in the immediate place in the text itself. Okay? I mean, running notes, though, I think are basically fairly obvious in some cases. I, I, I put some advice here just because I think there may be better ways of, uh, worse ways of doing it. Okay, now the round two notes are what I'm calling the process notes. This is what you do after you've finished reading a text. And these are the ones that at least I find I get using the most. I find you all may be different. I don't go back to my running notes very much at all because they're just not that useful for me in terms of just like a blow by blow of what the content area of the book is. Uh, ideally for me, these fit on maximum of two sides of paper, again, for the purposes of applying some discipline, making sure these are notes and not uh, volumes in and of themselves. And for me, they, they break out into a couple of different categories. Uh, first, I have a, a summary paragraph. And this is essentially where I'm letting the author do their thing, letting them tell me what they were up to, what they were studying, what their interpretation was, their basic arguments. I'm doing it in their terms, using their characterizations, and I'm not interpreting or reflecting. I'm not talking back to the text here. I'm doing my best to more or less write the book jacket text for this book. Um, the second paragraph is what I'm calling, the second section I'm calling reflections. And this is where you're making the material of your own, where you're really engaging it, where you're arguing with it, where you're interpreting it. And here I think it's useful to divide this up into two sections. One is essentially the parts that you like of this book. And the other would be, in some sense, the parts that you don't like. I'm drawing on uh, this author, whose book I have listed here, and, and giving these slightly more positive and productive terms than liked and didn't like. So I'm calling the first characterization forward. And what I mean here are these are the parts of this book that I want to see move forward. 
in my own world. This is what I'm going to be drawing on. This is going to empower and animate what I'm trying to do in my work. Right? Uh, this is what was worth doing. This was what was successfully executed. Right? The second characterization I'm calling countering. Right? And that's essentially what didn't work. What in my work is going to have to counter something in this book? Um, it doesn't have to be thought of in an especially critical or judgmental way, like what this author got wrong, right? why this book sucks. Uh, right? You can think of it generatively as what is there left to be said about this topic after this book article. Right? And countering, I think, is a language that helps us think about the ways that even in countering, we're indebted to the thing that we're countering. Right? Um, now, why these separate sections? Why not just like one, right, one big, long kind of prose poem about the book? Well, I think there are a couple of reasons for doing, for doing that. I think keeping these sections apart keeps you honest to some extent, because you're giving the author a chance to state their case on their own terms before you fully dive in. So by keeping your voice separate from the author's, I think you're keeping yourself intellectually honest about you know, the clash and the kind of convergence that's happening between two different minds and two different approaches. And I think in terms of why to keep the forwarding section and the countering section apart, as opposed to a kind of general reflections, is that I think it means that you're going to read fairly. That is to say that you're going to read both critically and generously in ways that your own impulses may not take you automatically. Um, so at least for me, I tend to be a very critical reader. So having a section where I'm going to have to talk about what I'm going to move forward with this book kind of keeps me on task in that sense. Okay, other sections for what I'm calling these process notes, this round two. Key quotations. I think one of the things that uh, I recommend that students do is that like, as you're reading, come up with five, seven, ten key quotations, short ones. I mean, I wouldn't transcribe paragraphs where you see the author stating their argument as clearly and forcefully and succinctly as possible. Um, one thing that it does really well is it kind of keeps you tethered to the book itself, that as you're paraphrasing, things can slip, right? Even if you're trying really hard, and there's a way that if you have the author's own words, not a lot of them, but just enough, it keeps you anchored in the book. Uh, it keeps your paraphrase and your engagement with the book kind of um, bound to the book itself. It's an important way. Um, okay, other things, useful bibliography. So if you're combing through the footnotes, you're looking at secondary and primary works that might be useful in your teaching, your research, things like that. You want to have a section that's essentially like what I'm calling these scratches or excavations, like just things that I can use for whatever I'm working on right now. You know, like very instrumental, very strategic things that you're going to take out of this that can plug into what you're doing in some other project. Now just one important thing before I move on is that I think it's very important that in the case of these two last categories, bibliography and these extractions, that you take them out of these notes and put them in the project folder or notebook that pertain to those projects. And this seems completely banal and mundane, but if you don't do that, it's going to be very hard to retrace your steps to try to figure out where was that book that sounded so cool about X. And I know this from intense personal frustration and experience on this point, so I'm trying to pass this along. Uh, be disciplined enough that when you come upon one of these things, it's going to be in your notes here, but make sure that you cut and paste into a file that pertains to the place where it belongs, because that's going to be the guarantee that you're actually able to use these things. Okay, round three. And this again is optional, because all this can be very time consuming at a moment when time is obviously very precious. Um, as you read, think about the ways that you would take this book and turn it into a set of questions that you could then ask uh, undergrads or grad students in a way that would generate a discussion and would explore the fullness of the book itself, or the article itself. You write down these questions in some kind of sequence, and then importantly, as you're reading, you come up with a handful of the answers that would be correct for answering that set of questions. Um, now, what's the advantage of doing this? Um, because again, it's another use of time, in a time when time can be scarce. I think there is a couple. One is that it's another third opportunity for you to engage this work in a way that's very different from the other two. Right? It's using a very different part of your mind, and it's applying things to a very different set of purposes in ways that I think is going to maximize the chance that this material is going to stick. Um, there's also a way in which, by turning a book into a set of questions, you're also able to get at a sense of what the author was trying to answer, and the kinds of questions that were animating the book or article itself. So this can also be a good strategy for reading, as well as teaching. 
And the third, and perhaps most obviously, if you do this as you're reading, particularly with books you think are going to be important in your future, the kitchen plans, ready to go. Presuming that you've organized enough to keep track of these in the interval between taking these notes and then teaching. And in my case, that's not a done deal. But uh, you all may be quite different about that. Um, so for myself, I think this can be a really advantageous way of, again, processing these notes in ways that have both cognitive and very practical, very practical effects. Um, uh, finally, a kind of extra secret next level tip here, um, which is that actually what I find increasingly over time is that you can substitute this way of taking notes for your running notes in the first place. So that instead of actually doing the kind of page by page, from the beginning you're already thinking about what are the questions that would open up this particular page or set of pages in a book. And this can actually be the kind of substitute for your running notes um, and in ways that, again, generate um, more efficient generation of teaching plans. Um, okay. Um, okay. The question of sorting and organizing notes, um, obviously there are questions of software that we can talk about during the Q&A. You guys are likely to be much more up to date about what is a useful product. Obviously Zotero, EndNote, Evernote are some of the ones that consistently come up. I think they all have their advantages and disadvantages. Um, what I'd suggest, and, and I'm sure many if not all of you have your preferred ones, you may already be committed. If you're not, you might experiment, find one you like that works for you, and then stick with it. And I think here discipline is really important. And I got to speak not uh, as someone who exemplifies this kind of discipline. Because my notes are, I don't use these programs especially effectively, but I can understand why I should. And, uh, and people that I know and colleagues of mine who do reap the benefits of them again and again. The key, I think, is to tag it and using keywords so that any of the notes that you take are indexable by topic as well as by author and title, right? So you can get into this material through lots of different avenues, conceptually. And again, with what I'm calling these extractions, these strategic things that you go in in order to get out for your project, make sure that you take them and put them immediately in the folder where they belong, rather than leaving them in the files for the works themselves. And then finally, obviously, backing up, backing up, backing up. And I say that as someone who spilled the class of orange juice into my laptop the, uh, about two weeks before my dissertation was due, and, um, and saw sparks and fireworks fly as my data evaporated. Um, so, uh, and luckily I had backups, but they were about a month out of date, so I had a lot of writing to do that I didn't need to do otherwise. So again, um, uh, I, I send this along not as an exemplar, but as a victim of, uh, of this advice. Um, okay, let me see what else. Okay, a couple of things. So this was the book that I like on reading, uh, 10 Days of Faster Reading. It's got a cheesy subtitle, Self-Improvement, it's only 10 minutes a day, blah, 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 will improve your life. Um, it's got very, very effective and good advice. It's a quick read itself. Um, so if you're interested in improving your basic skill set in and around reading, uh, this would be a book that I recommend. Um, okay, one final note about note taking. When do you actually go back and write down new things about your notes? Like when do you revisit these notes? Um, and here I suggest a couple of different times. One would be any time you go back and reread the original book or your text. You should pull out the notes because you're going to see new things. That's something that I'm constantly surprised at, is I go back, I reread something, I go back to my notes, and there are huge parts of the argument I missed the first time. Uh, it's embarrassing. You kind of have this moment of truth where you realize, I thought I was so smart then. Um, I missed whole things. I think I'm smart now. Oh my gosh, what am I going to think in 10 years, right? I mean, we're human. We're reading fast. Our minds are changing, ideally. Um, and so when you revisit, you should go back and revisit your notes, modify your notes. One thing people don't do very often, which I think is really worth doing, is to take five minutes after a graduate seminar or a class that you teach, go back to the notes that you took for it, and revisit at that exact moment. That's usually the time where you're like exhausted, you're running out for coffee, you're running to a different meeting, but it's often immediately at those moments when I think I know what the book is really about. It's something that we came upon in that seminar, right? Something in the context of that conversation where I figured out no, actually, the crux, the really interesting question is not something I came in with, it's something I figured out in the context of the class. You want to put that down, because that's not going to be there in your mind when you teach that book or article two years from now. It's just going to evaporate. Um, so I think after you teach a class where you've had a conversation where you feel like you've come to some new relationship to the material, that's a moment to sit down with those notes. And the same is true um, uh, after graduate seminar. So, um, okay, I'm going to end that section there, and maybe we'll just... 
take questions for a few minutes, and I can move on to the part two.